And preferences, identifying preferences. This should be the first step of any function-based assessment, is looking at what does this individual like? What are the conditions under which they do well? So when you're getting a referral about a child having problem behavior and all of the conversation and all of the questions are about that problem behavior, you need to balance that with what are the situations under which they do well? What do they love? When do they smile? When do they laugh? That is just as important. Um, I monitor for indices of happiness, right? This can be something that you measure. Maybe we should be measuring how often our kiddos are smiling and laughing and talking about being happy in addition to how often they're engaging in aggression or self-injury. And preferences change over time. We know this is true for all of us. So we need to be assessing them regularly in our kids. And there are different types of preference assessments as well. But in general, you can look at what the child does in free play. What do they go to? You can also expose them to things one at a time and see how they engage with it. Or you can offer them a series of choices, first choice paradigm. Wouldn't it just be easier to tell me what I can do, right? <laughs> not just what I can't do. Using visual cues, consistent routines, these are the things that are probably pretty common sense to you all because you're, you're clinical and you've noticed that these things work for most kids most of the time. Visual cues, right? Make it as explicit as possible. Morning routine, a form of self-monitoring, helping a kiddo to recognize he loves Thomas the Train. So helping him recognize what it looks like when he's tired, or when I'm engaging in like this, when, I, you know, when I'm engaging with my environment in these ways, that might mean I'm tired and I need to rest. Or I'm calm, just the right level of activation. Or I have too much energy, my body is moving too fast, and maybe I can cross over and be very upset very quickly. Another visual system for someone who's a little bit more verbal, where they can rate where they are on this thermometer of how they're feeling and they can have a set of coping skills already listed out. What do I do when I'm in the yellow to keep myself from going to the orange, et cetera? And again, communication is the most important thing, okay? And it's individualized. What works, especially with autism, we have speech generating devices, we have picture exchange systems, we have sign language, we have verbal communication. So um, being open-minded to lots of different systems and figuring out what works best for that individual it's the best gift you can give them. I'm going to turn it over to Ashley for our case study. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Ashley LeBay, and I am a BCBA and the program manager at the Autism Treatment Center. Um, today I'm going to do a case study on one of our individuals that we worked with. Um, and we're using a pseudonym, so today we're going by Michael for all of his information. Um, so some background information about by Michael. When he first started with us, he was 14. He is now 15. Um, but before then, he had no experience with applied behavior analysis. Um, his diagnosis, diagnoses were autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, and he also had a, has a speech impairment as well. Um, the challenging behaviors we're going to focus on and go over today are self-injury and disrobing. And um, for Michael's communication, he is nonverbal, and when he came to us, he had no form of communication at all. Okay, so earlier, um, Jessica was talking about how we operationally define behaviors. So these are... Um, his self-injury, or SIB as we also call it, and disrobing operational definitions. So we define them in measurable and observable ways. Um, so everyone is on the same page. If I'm um, taking data on this, or if Jessica is, or if anyone is, they're able to track the exact same thing. Um, his self-injury looked like taking one or both hands and making contact with the side of his head and his dis, well also, sorry, um, he also engaged in biting. So Jessica was talking earlier about um, him biting his forearm or his hand, Ooh, sorry, and uh, to, to the point where he had calluses all over um, the side of both of his hands actually. His disrobing is just any attempt or successful attempt at taking off any part of his clothing. 
Okay. Um, so earlier, Jessica was also talking about functional analysis. So this is the most valid assessment that we can do with um, individuals who engage in challenging behavior. So this is a graph of um, Michael's overall challenging behavior for his functional analysis. So on this y-axis, you see the percentage of intervals that he engaged in challenging behavior during our assessment. And the x-axis shows um, the session numbers. So as you can see, um, we have elevated behavior, challenging behavior, and the attention condition, the escape condition, and the tangible condition as well. Um, this free play condition, uh, it shows these um, diamonds. It shows that it stayed at zero the entire throughout the entire assessment, which is something that we really want. So we want to be able to show that we can control the behavior. We can turn it on and we can turn it off. So whenever we're giving him all the attention and he has his most preferred items and we're not placing any demands at all, you can see that he doesn't engage in any challenging behavior. But whenever we place demands or divert our attention or take away his most preferred items, he does engage in challenging behavior. And that's why you see the increases in the escape, attention, and tangible um, graph, the, that part of the graph. Okay, so now I'm going to break um, his two behaviors into different graphs. So the top graph shows his disrobing um, this robing data for the functional analysis. And what we see in that graph is that his disrobing is maintained by access to attention um, and also access to tangibles. So um, we saw it, if we diverted our attention, he would try to disrobe. If we gave him attention, then he would stop his disrobing. Same with um, uh, access to tangibles. If we were to take his most preferred item away, he would disrobe, and then if we gave it back to him, he would stop disrobing. For this bottom graph, um, it is his self-injury graph, and what we see there is his self-injury is maintained by access to tangibles and escape from demands. So if we were to place demands on him, um, or dive, uh, take away his preferred item, he would engage in challenging behavior. But when we place a demand, if he engaged in self-injury, um, and then we said, okay, you don't have to work, you can take a break, he would stop engaging in his self-injury. Um, same with the taking the item away. If we took an item away and he engaged in self-injury, once we gave it back, he would stop that. And both of these graphs you can also see um, the play condition is at zero, so we are able to control that behavior and turn it off. Um, this is just recapping over his results. So disrobing was maintained by attention and access to preferred items, and his self-injury was maintained by access to preferred items and escape from demands. And Jessica also mentioned earlier how escape from demands and access to preferred items kind of can go hand in hand. Because if I escape, if I escape my work, sometimes I also get access to what I want. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about some different interventions that we used with Michael. Um, so we have antecedent interventions and consequence interventions that we use. Um, antecedent or preventative interventions are things we do before the behavior occurs to prevent that behavior from occurring. So three different ones that we used for Michael were our functional communication training, demand fading, and differential attention, and I'll be going um, into more detail on each of these. Okay, so functional communication training the first step of this is finding the function of the behavior, which um, we, I've already went over those graphs, so we know the function specifically for his self-injury is access to preferred items. So the second step then is teaching a communication response. So um, since Michael is, is nonverbal, we used picture exchange for his communication response. So what that looked like is we would prompt him to communicate using a picture card for what he wanted. If he um, engaged in the appropriate communication, he gets what he wants. If he engaged in challenging behavior, he does not get what he wants. 
And we also use, um, when teaching the communication, we use most to least prompting. So we don't want him to make a lot of errors because then he's more likely to engage in challenging behavior. So what we do is we over prompt and then we back ourselves off slowly. Um, so the first thing that we would do is I would take my hand over Michael's hand and help him grab the picture and hand it to the communication partner. Once he does that, then he gets access to whatever he wanted. So, for example, he really liked paint. We would have a paint picture. Um, once he gives that paint picture to the communication partner, he gets paint and he gets to... Um, he gets to paint. And if he engaged in challenging behavior, he would not get access to that. The next step would be a partial prompt. So instead of hand over hand full prompting him, um, I could just point at the picture. So say there was a picture board. I took his paint away, and then I just pointed at the picture I want him to hand to me. He can hand that picture to me, and then he gets his paint. And then we want to go all the way to independent. So eventually, we definitely want him to be independent with his communication. So he picks up the picture by himself and then gets access to um, that item. One really important thing is no matter what prompt level you're on, if the child or individual engages in the appropriate communication response, you do want to reinforce that. So even though you're helping him communicate, you still want him to get access to that item because we want to increase that appropriate communication. So he learns, I hand you this picture and then I get all I get the stuff I want. Um, this is another example of a picture board. This is more like a picture binder. So this is for individuals who are more advanced um, in their communication using picture exchange. With Michael, we started off with just one picture. So we start off very small. So if he wants paint, I'm going to have only that paint picture on there. And then we'll slowly um, start teaching him how to discriminate between different pictures and be able to tell us different items that he wants. Okay, um, his self-injury was also maintained by escape from demands. So one thing that we used um, for this is something called demand fading. So we start really low with the require work requirements and then we'll slowly increase those requirements as we see his challenging behavior decrease. So what that looked like for Michael is we would normally have a timer, say we had a five minute timer. The timer goes off, and then we would present a first then board. Um, on the first then board, it would say first, and then we would have a picture of working, and then then, and a picture of playing. So we'd say first work, and then you get to play. Um, and then we would present one demand. Um, once he completed that one demand, then he would get access to whatever he worked for, so painting, iPad, whatever his, pre his preference was. Um, and then, once we see his challenging behavior decrease, we increase the work requirements. So once he can do one task without engaging in challenging behavior, then we'll start requiring two tasks, and then three tasks. So we start very low and slowly work up to more tasks that he has to do before he can get reinforced. Um, another note is if he did engage in challenging behavior, he would not get a break from work. Um, we don't keep repeating the demand over and over again. If anything, we would repeat it like once a minute, just saying, remember, first work and then we can play. Um, but if he engages in challenging behavior, he doesn't get his fun stuff, he doesn't get out of work, that demand still stays in place until he completes that demand. Okay, so now I'm gonna go over his self-injury graphs. So on the y-axis, we have rate of self-injury and the x-axis we have the session number. So as you can see, when Michael first started with us, he was engaging in self-injury anywhere between 50 and over 200 instances of self-injury in a two and a half hour session. So that's a lot of self-injury in a two and a half hour session. Um, once we started intervention, which was the demand fading and um, functional communication training, we see an amazing decrease in his challenging behavior. Um, one really awesome thing about this graph as well is um, this line that says six month break. The grant that helped provide services to Michael um, 
is six months on and six months off. So unfortunately, he did have to take a six month break, but what is awesome is you can see his behavior maintained during that six month break. So um, even though he was off for six months and didn't have any ABA at that time, he, he, his behavior stayed decreased to the levels um, from when he, before the six month break. That is also with a lot of, his grandma was great, she used the picture exchange at home, used the visuals at home, and really helped generalize those communication skills to the home setting. And then currently, um, you can see, we've seen even more of a decrease in this last six months we've been with him, and it's to near zero levels now. And I have a, this is a graph of his current six months for his, uh, um, self-injury, so we've seen a really good decrease, and now um, it's below five instances in, during his session. We've also seen a decrease in intensity as well, so it's not he's not doing it as hard as he used to. He may just like barely bite versus his hard, harder, more intense bites or hits. Okay, so um, for his disrobing, we found that that was maintained by access to attention. So something that we use is differential attention, and what that looks like is we're gonna give Michael attention every 30 seconds as long as he's not engaging in challenging behavior. Because if he already has our attention, then he doesn't need to engage in challenging behavior to get our attention. So we're gonna give him attention more often, and then we can fade that back as well. Um, uh, something that we also did for disrobing is neutral blocking. So we don't actually want him to engage in disrobing. So what we would do, um, and Jessica mentioned, like if a child is engaging in self-injury, we don't want to just ignore that. So we do use blocking techniques, but still provide minimal attention during that time. So with, his, uh, with the neutral blocking, what that would look like is if he was um, going to like pull his pants down, we would stand behind him and make sure he couldn't get his pants down, but then we also, he didn't have much of our attention. We weren't making eye contact. We weren't like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? We were just very neutral in blocking that response. Okay, this is his disrobing graph for um, his whole time with us. And... Uh, as you, it's the same with the rate of disrobing on the y-axis and sessions on the x-axis. And um, we do see a decrease from, for his first six months, but towards the end we saw an increase during that time. Um, that could have been due to a few different things. He did have a change in um, case manager and um, some changes in therapist as well. So just different people working with him. It could have been a treatment um, fidelity issue, as well as um, possibly not knowing exactly what the function is at that time. When he got that new case manager, there was some, that case manager had some confusion about what his function was, so he could have actually been reinforcing the challenging behavior instead of, um, instead of working on it appropriately. But as you see, after his six month break, um, he was able to decrease, we were able to decrease his challenging behavior to near zero levels, or pretty much zero for the last four sessions at least. This is his um, dis current disrobing graph, and um, it's just more blown up for this last six months, and you can see a really good decrease with his, uh, with his disrobing.